Hello everyone, it's me Bradley, and today I'd like to give a long overdue update on a story I covered earlier. So, about two weeks ago, I uploaded a video about the New York Magazine story cancelled at 17. That video will be linked in the description, and I recommend checking it out if you aren't familiar. So, just to recap, the New York Magazine subsequent uh, cut published an article about a teenage boy dubbed Diego who decided to share his girlfriend's nudes with others at a party and consequently got iced out by most of the people at his school. The article was very poorly received due to being quite badly written, presenting Diego's setting as a horrific injustice rather than an unsurprising consequence for a major violation of someone's trust and privacy. In my video, I discussed the possibility that certain part of the article, if not the entire thing, weren't just poorly written but made up. Now, that video was a bit of a challenge to make due to certain time constraints. I first heard of the article shortly after it was published, but it wasn't until around June 26 that I saw stuff that made me consider the possibility that the article wasn't factually honest. However, I was scheduled to go home for my apartment just a couple of days later so I could be with my family for the 4th of July. Recording commentary at home would be hard to do without disturbing other people, so I tried to get my script done and recorded the night before I left. That actually went well. I got the whole thing written out, and I was able to get a solid recording. Honestly, better than expected. However, another thing that I didn't expect is that we'd learn more about the project just after my script finished. As it turned out, Gawker happened to release an article that he saw earlier on the day when I finished my project. According to the article, the school where the incident supposedly took place wasn't just some random location. It was the school where the author's kids had gone. Now, let's cover the obvious questions. This sounds like a, like a potential conflict of interest. How did it get approved? To understand this, we need to look at two things that happened here separately. First, the author chose to report on a story that he probably first heard about through local gossip and rumors, and concerned people who she may have known personally. This isn't unethical by nature. Plenty of authors find stories this way, and just because the journalists knew people they were writing about beforehand doesn't actually mean there's a conflict of interest there. Second, the author conceals the names of all the people involved. While this obviously has a potential for abuse, given that nobody can actually verify the story without doing a good deal of investigation, it's not unreasonable to do for a story that covers minors. On top of that, the story itself gives the impression that Diego's parents are more than a little bit lawsuit happy, so I can consider that there is a reason why the New York Magazine decided not to put themselves at risk there. So, without looking at any of the actual article content, there is an obvious issue here. However, the content of the article is exactly why it garnered a backlash when it was first published, and this revelation cast it in an entirely new light. As discussed in the previous video, the article was almost transparently positively slanted towards Diego, minimizing his accent and presenting negative reactions to his behavior as signs of a grave moral panic. This alone is bad enough, but the fact that the writer's children had attended the school where this took place opened up the possibility that she had some sort of personal involvement, which would easily explain why she seems so attached to a specific side. The fact that the article didn't at all mention the personal connection also infected the framing. The article made a big deal of presenting the story as something that could happen anywhere, not something the author had only known only seen firsthand and may have been distorted by her own personal biases. And without Gawker's reporting, none of this crucial information would be known to us. And the thing is, if you were to not have to reveal the location of the school involved to avoid this, they could have just put in a disclaimer saying that the author found out about the story because it was taking place at a school her kids had been to. So, there are a number of different statements released by the author and the media company that owns the cut. The first one, from the media company, says that they were aware of the connection, but did not find it rose to the level of a conflict of interest. Also claimed that they thoroughly vetted the story and stand by its integrity. Of course, as we discussed in the last video, there are plenty of reasons to doubt the story's full integrity, so you can really take all of this with a grain of salt if you want. Second, 
Wyle claims she hadn't personally known any of the people involved in the story. I'd like to note that personally no is a tricky thing in this case. It's quite believable that Wyle wasn't a close acquaintance of any of these people. However, a lot of the article describes arguments and discussions held on Facebook groups and other places. I can't but help but find it a bit dubious to suggest Wyle had never seen any of those of those groups before, given that she was clearly paying a lot of attention to them. Then the spokesperson claimed that Wyle didn't have a kid at the school when the events in the story took place. And finally, Wyle gave a statement to Slate. I didn't know any of the subjects personally, and I haven't had a kid in the school in years. There was no no conflict. This is not a personal story. Gawker is being Gawker. So, what can we say about all these statements? None of them explain why there wasn't a disclaimer. That should have obviously been necessary. Second, as Gawker's article points out, there are a number of reasons why the missing framing is bad. While the article tries to pass the, off the backlash against sexual assault in schools as hysteria caused by students spending too long in isolation because of COVID, this sort of activism was reportedly going on in the Bay Area, the general location of the school where the incident took place, well before the pandemic. The main cause of this was changes to the system for dealing with these sort of incidents put in place by Betsy DeVos. A Trump pointy whose choices were usually made in the, with the goal of destroying public education in mind. That last part isn't actually an exaggeration. That's something she has explicitly says she wants to do. The changes to Title IX severely limited what counts as harassment under Title IX, limited what schools could actually do under Title IX, and relaxed requirements on when schools were required to investigate. These changes also made so the procedure for mediation was changed from a model focused on addressing the victim's needs to one where it is assumed both the victim and the perpetrator in a case of sexual assault are both at fault. Wyle specifically points out the issue in part, but neglects to mention what led to it becoming standard. All of this goes to show how omitting information on when and where a story happened serves to distort the facts particularly in a way that serves the author's narrative. Additionally, one thing that I talked about in my last video was that the article seemed heavy on exaggerated or dubious sounding quotes and claims. I even spent a bit of time comparing the way the article read to a really bad book written in MFA tryhard style. With the knowledge that the story was once he had at least originally heard from local gossip, Weird writing seems to be a result of her either hearing specific statements that banned for a game of Facebook group telephone, or trying to flesh out more vague claims. So, after all this, what's left to discuss? Well, the story seems to have mostly run its course. I haven't seen any new articles about the story since the time I made the last video. The writer has learned to avoid bringing up anything related to it since it attacks snarky commenters. There hasn't really been any real interesting discord since, and mostly it's just kind of dead. It's quite likely that this video will be the last time anyone talks about this story, and that's fine. Really, blue check journalist writes a city bias article isn't anything new, and if I want to make to make talking about that a big part of my channel, which I kind of do. I'll probably have no shortage of subjects to look at. Really, this whole thing has been kinda uplifting. The article in question was ripped apart for its bias, poor writing, and failure to disclose key info, and that's the way it should be. As for me, I don't know what I'm going to do next. I certainly don't intend to go so long without releasing anything. Something I'm probably going to do is look at video editing programs other than OpenShot, and while OpenShot is okay, the sheer frequency at which it crashes just makes making these products really frustrating. When going for my video files, I realized I basically recorded a whole let's play of a game on itch.io but never got around to uploading it, so I expect to see that getting featured here at some point. Which one am I going to make next? I'm not sure. It's probably going to be something like this video, but maybe it, I'll try and make something entirely new the next time. I think that just about wraps things up. Good luck everyone, and I look forward to seeing you again in the future.